what is the end goal that Islam wants to achieve? They want to convert entire world into Muslims, into Islamic world, which is which they call as Darul Islam. That would mean if today the population is 800 billion, they are trying to convert 600 billion people to Islam. Is that going to be peaceful? Any ideology which for 1400 years shows this butchery, this intolerance in such a large geog geographical area. I have not talked about what they did to Christians. Then can you say that it is few isolated incidents? Something taken out of context? No, all of them were scholars of Quran. Ho sakta hai ke tumhe bura lage, tum par jihad farz kiya gaya. Farz, farz hai, isme koi option nahi hai ke aap nahi karoge. To har wo muslim jo jihad karta hai, wo achha muslim hai. To jo KK Muhammad ki ya hum baat kar rahe the, humare kalam saad ki, wo bad muslims hai. They are according to Quran, according to Islam, they are bad muslims. <laughs>
And if you think that's a modern day fantasy or a modern day romanticism, uh, you know, inspired by the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, this is one example I would like to show. This is called uh, Bavar Palli in Shabrimala, where crores of Ayyappa devotees happily go to this Erimeli Bavar Mosque or Vavar Mosque as we call it in Malayalam. More than crores devotees go there, offer our respect in this Erimeli Mosque before going to Shabrimala because that's how Swami Ayyappa or Lord Ayyappa instructed us to do. And the interesting thing is, you know, in, even inside the temple, there is a Vavar Nada that we call Vavar Nada is a Vavar Shrine, you can take it a Vavar Shrine. In that Vavar Shrine, there is no idol or anything kept inside the temple, I am saying, inside the temple, respecting the Islamic community. So when even our deities, even our God, Swami Ayyappa can be pluralist, why can't we be? When Swami Vivekananda can be pluralistic and say all religions can be the path to God, why can't we be? Is a legitimate and genuine question asked. This is the Bavar Pulli and the Hindu festivals. Hindu pilgrims are welcome there. These are all the photographs you can see. An Islamic scholar applying Bhasma to a Hindu devotee going there. These are some great examples of the pluralistic framework we have. This is the Erimeli Mosque and there is another legend and history of Swami Ayyappa where he was a close friend of not only the Muslim Vavar but also a Christian called Velita where you know pilgrims also go to the Velita church. So my point here that's the Vavar Nada where Swami Ayyappa is there and it's inside the you know Hindu temple where there is an Islamic space or Islamic shrine. Yeah. So my core submissions in the last two minutes, I only have two minutes left for the introduction are five. Every faith and philosophy can be understood and interpreted in various ways. Not only Islam, Hinduism and the other philosophies can be do. Every text has a context and a subtext. If we take out the particular context and if we take out the subtext, it can really be troublesome. And we have to understand our Manusmritis, which is unfairly criticized by the leftists and the Islamists, or our Vedas and Puranas, which is unfairly attacked by the ultra-feminist or the ultra-leftist. Similarly, every book, if you don't understand the context and the subtext, it can be misunderstood and misinterpreted. Third, just like the hardline Islamists or the Christian conversionists or the ultra-left, you know, the urban Naxals, are attacking Hindu Sanadana Dharma for casteism, for treatment of women, their imagination of treatment of women, or some of the text regarding the so-called lower caste communities. These are contextual and unless we understand it in the context, it will be a trouble for us. Four, pluralism and respect to all faiths by Swami Vivekananda is one of the core positions we have always upheld. This is what makes us the Vishuguru. We shouldn't go back on that position. And five, coming to the last minute, yes, Islam is a religion of peace because just like other faiths, Hindu, Christian, Buddhist, Taoist, Jain, Jew, every faith has positive aspects and negative aspects. If we pick on only the negative aspects and create a narrative that this is wrong, then it is unfair for every religion because so even if you interpret Islam, in there are a Salafist, Wahhabi way of interpreting Islam. There are different moderate ways of interpreting Islam. There are Sufi Islam. There are various paths. And we have coexisted with Islamic religion for the past 1,500, nearly 1,000, 1,400 years. So I believe that benefit of the doubt should be given rather than for literal interpretation, which only takes out the negative aspect. I have taken some particular uh, ayats and taken some particular paragraphs from the Holy Quran in the next 20 minutes where I can present. And I would like to conclude by saying, every religion is a religion of peace, is a religion of spirituality. We have to see it in a right context. And there may be some parts of every religion which can be prone to misinterpretation. We should take the right in this interpretation, encourage and enhance the moderate people for that. And when you look textually too, there can be some aspects which may be rightly criticized. It is not only in Quran, it can be there in Bible, it can be there in Vedas, it can be there in Ramayana. So we should take the positive aspects of every religion, promote the moderates and rule out the fringe where Islamophobia or Hindu phobia or Christian phobia is promoted. So that moderate aspect is what we have to look for is my submission. And in the next round, I believe we can go into the specifics. These are my opening comments. Thank you. Right now, when we are talking, we are discussing here, somewhere in the underground tunnels of Palestine, there are some hostages which are being kept by the Hamas terrorists. And what happened before that was, what they did was, we all saw a lot of what was happening over there. The true Muslims there terrorized, killed, plundered, raped, 
and tortured innocent civilians, most of them Jews, before taking them as hostages. Now, is it Islam? Or the question that can be asked is, does Hamas represent Islam? The answer is absolutely. They represent the truest form of Islam. These were the exact deeds which were performed by Muhammad, the founder of Islam, during his lifetime and by his companions who are called Sahaba in Islam at the behest of Muhammad during his lifetime and since then the same modus operandi has continued till today and Hamas is just the latest manifestation of that process that was started by Muhammad about 1400 centuries ago. Now, Muhammad is considered to be the ideal human being according to Quran, according to the Islamic text. And they are exactly following Muhammad to the T. For example, somebody might ask that why would they kill and then take hostages? There is a specific verse in Quran that is chapter number 33, verse number 21. I'll just read it out for you. Indeed, in the messenger of Allah, you have a good example to follow for him who hopes in Allah and the last day and remembers Allah much. Now that is what Hamas terrorists are doing. And for that matter, every, every Islamic terrorist on the entire planet, they are doing the same thing. The modus operandi remains the same. What Muhammad did during his lifetime, that has to be emulated by every true Muslim. It has a specific name in Islam, which is known as Sunnat. And that is what is being followed again, word by word to the T. Then the question can be, since we are discussing, is it a religion of peace? Can these activities bring peace? Try to imagine a girl who was having a party with her friends. She is picked up by these terrorists. She is gang raped. Her breasts are hacked off using knives. And then they play with those breasts. And then one of them pulls back her hair, shoots her through her head. She is dead. So it can be religion of death, but it cannot be religion of peace. Now when they take those hostages with them, for that also there is a specific verse which I am going to quote. This is chapter number 8, verse number 67. It is not for a prophet that he should have prisoners of war until he had made a great slaughter in the land. You desire the good of this world, but Allah desires the hereafter. The Allah is almighty, all wise. This is what those Muslims are doing. Those who have seen that footage, some of them were invited by Israelis to watch that footage and they've seen it. All of them are making a very common observation. The observation is that when these demons, they were perpetrating these horrific crimes, there was no sense of remorse. On the contrary, there was a glee on their faces, utter glee on their faces when they were butchering these hapless people. They were killing after gang raping a girl who had done no harm to them. In fact, few hours ago, she was having a party. And this is what they did to her. Now, instead of asking whether Islam is a religion of peace, we should be asking what inspires them to do this. And that is where Islam and its text comes in. And again, I'll try to quote it from here. What were they doing with that, those women? Were they not human beings for them? The answer is, Quran tells them to treat them as chattel, as their sex slaves. This is again enshrined in Quran, chapter number 4, verse number 24. I'll just read it for you. Also forbidden are women already married, except those whom your right hand possesses, which is a euphemism for what you have caught during the jihad which you are perpetrating. That was my opening statement and I very vehemently state that Islam is not a religion of peace. It is a religion of death. It is something which we must try to avoid spreading and we must try to contain it. Thank you, Neeraji. So before I start with religion, I would like to give a context to the entire thing. This is what is popularly called the socio-political spectrum of India. We usually listen to words like leftist, rightist, centrist, moderates. 
So what is this left and right is something I would like to point out because there is a direct connection to what we are talking there. One, for example, we all know Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, many of, you know, many of his positions we disagree with, but he was the respectable first Prime Minister of India. He was more towards the left. And Sardar Vallabhai Patel, he was more towards the right or right-leaning. Center is more of, the center space is occupied by Mahatma Gandhi. If you take the US, the center space, you no, know, right now Joe Biden is more of ruling as a centrist as he claims, but the right-wing space is by Republicans. A bit more ultra-right is the Trump or the MAGA, Make America Great Again campaign. The left is more of the democratic space. If you see the Indian context, to the center left is Pandit Nehru, more left is the old Congress socialist who became CPM, CPI. More left is the urban Naxal or the Maoist or the extremist on one side. To the right, we have Sardar Vallabhai Patel. We have the first genuine economically right-wing thinking, see Rajagobal Ajari and the Swadandra Party. To the right, we have Shyama Prasad Mukherjee, RSS, Janasangh, BJP. Or even to the further right, we have Abhinav Bharat, God says or God say Vadis. This is the spectrum of any land. There is a far left, there is a far right. In usually Indian terminology, we don't agree with these kind of socio-political realities and we blindly argue that only our position is right. But there is a genuine left and genuine right in every nation. Even courts, our judges are either conservative leaning or liberal leaning. Conservative is what uh, the earlier Chief Justice of India, Sri Deepak Misra was. We all know Justice Chandrachud is the quintessential example of being a left liberal where he goes on to say even we don't have any absolutely biological male or a female, it is all fluid. See, that's a classic left-wing position. There is nothing wrong in it, but that's a left-wing position. Now, connecting to our debate, the ultra-left always tries to generate something called a Hindu phobia, a Sanadana Dharma phobia, where we can see DMKs, the Dravidian parties, Udayanidhi Stalin always say Sanadana Dharma is a disease. I, I cannot even repeat that, but as we all know what he said, I can repeat for the, you know, uh, our argument's sake. Udayanidhi Stalin saying Sanadana Dharma is dengue, cancer, malaria. It should not be opposed, it should be eradicated. This is their so-called Dravidian position, which is echoed by far leftist and all. So when you come to the left, you have a institutionalized Hindu phobia, where we put on, or they put on a mask of intellectualism, so-called progressivism, where they promote Hindu phobia as an academic project, which we should rightly oppose. They born, they born Manisuludhi, I saw in one of the um, Neeraji's video, rightly, the Islamist and leftist attacking. And there are many people who consider it fashionable to burn uh, Manus Murthy or even Periyor Ramaswam and Aikar, the great uh, Dravidian Tamil icon once threatened to burn Holy Ramayana. So this is the ultra left or the ultra anti-Hindu space that is there in our land. Similarly, when you move to the right, when you move from Narendra Modi ji is always towing a balance line where he even registered India's protest uh, when the Swedish Quran burning took place, India proudly said, no holy book should be burned and we are against the burning and India registered. Under Modi ji itself, you know, our nation registered our protest because that is not our position. Respecting every religion while criticizing intellectually, some of the aspects is accepted. But burning of Quran or Gita or Bible or Dhammapada or any book is not accepted is a common position we uphold. So, but when you move to the farther right, we have... Just like the Hindu phobia in the left liberal circle, we have a Islamophobia in the right liberal circle, right conservative, ultra right circle, where we attack Islam for many things. We, uh, we attack and create a kind of phobia for everything. Yes, I, I totally agree with Neeraji's introductory comments. What Hamas did was absolutely horrible. What Hamas did was nearly 1,200. Earlier, the Israelis said it was 1,400. Now they revised it to 1,200. 1,200 people were killed. Children were you know, subjected to horrific things. The women uh, were subjected to horrific things. That was an absolute terrorist attack. We should not shy away from saying so. But please remember, that was not Holy Quran or Islam in action. That was Hamas, which is an extremist organization, which is having such terror activities in action. I am not using the word terrorist organization because India till now has not designated Hamas as a terrorist organization. Maybe in future we will. But uh, our Prime Minister from a right conservative circle or a center right circle and people like Shashi Tharoor from a center left circle rightly called it a terror attack and we should not shy away because we want to appease Muslims. We shouldn't, uh, we should not not say it is a terrorist attack. It was a terrorist attack. So what Hamas did and what Quran says are two different things. For example, there are a lot of Islamic nations where Hindus are living happily. Take the case of UAE, United Arab Emirates. Take the case of Qatar. Take the case of Bahrain. Many places in Middle East. They have even opened a temple. 
So if they are in effect practicing you know, what they are saying against kafirs or idol worshippers, will they be doing so? There are opposition to various strands of practicing religion and faith. Don't we have our own glorious Arya Samaj who don't believe in idol worship, who don't believe in temple system? Arya Samajis are against this. No, Arya doesn't promote violence, but ideologically they are against idol worship and temple worship. We happily coexist with them. And the irony of ironies is that right now if you have to enter temples, especially in places like Guruvayur, you have to take Arya Samaj certification. Arya Samaj will certify that you are a Hindu and you can enter the temple. But Arya Samaj doesn't basically believe in what we call the idol or what they used to call idol worship and temple worshipping system. So such varied systems of worship are natural anywhere in the world. That's the reason why we should have a centrist or moderate attitude. We shouldn't fall to the both extremes of either creating a phobia against any religion. Now let me give a specific context to Quran and the topic we are discussing here. I am giving you a text, I mean, with due apologies, with due apology, I will tell you why I am apologizing up front. I am giving you a text and uh, if this is written in a holy book, how will we feel? Whenever and wherever there is a decline in religion and predominant rise of other religions, at that time I come myself to protect the religious believers and to kill the non-believers as well as to re-establish religion, I myself appear from time to time. Suppose if, if this is written in a particular text, how do we feel is a question because dharma can also be interpreted as religion. We usually say sarva dharma samabhavana to denote there are various religions. For example, if I am misinterpreting, again I am stressing on the word misinterpreting, I am misinterpreting it like this. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in Hindu religion and a predominant rise of other religions, read it as Christians and Muslims. At that, time, at that time I come to protect the Hindus and annihilate or destroy the non-Hindus, say read it Muslims and Christians, as well as to re-establish principles of Hindus, I myself come millennium after millennium. If this is the interpretation of one of the most glorious and the best verses of Bhagavad Gita, many of you might have understood what is that real verse. The real verse is Yada Yada Hi Dharmasya Glanir Bhavadi Bharada Abhyutanam Adharmasya if the word dharma I take and replace it with religion, which is a very normal interpretation, that shouldn't be done. I'm not saying it should be done. I'm saying it is a misinterpretation. So if I take the word dharma and put there as religion, since Krishna is saying and no other religions were at that point of time, I am replacing the word religion with, I'm creating a bhashya with the word Hindu. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in Hindu, I come to protect Hindus and kill the non-Hindus. Will we agree? I would be jumping up than the first person to oppose because that's a wrong interpretation. Some words here and there, if we can change the meaning, the context, the subtext, the entire, can, entire thing can be presented in a very negative light. For example, here what Bhagavan is saying is, whenever there is a decline in righteousness, whenever there is a decline in ethics, whenever the world goodness goes down, I come. And when there is a rise of adharma, what he means by adharma is lack of ethics, lack of righteousness, lack of virtue. But adharma can also be, if dharma is religion, adharma can be anti-religion. And adharma can be anti-religion means I can also substitute as non-Hindus. I mean, I'm not saying that we should do. I'm telling there can be a possibility of misinterpretation. And to present the good sadhus, he is saying the good people should be protected. But somebody is questioning and say, who decides what is good? Your Bhagavad Gita decides what is good. So whose text is Bhagavad Gita? Hindu text is Bhagavad Gita. So to protect Hindu people and to destroy Adharmis. Who is Adharmis? Other religions. It is an absolute wrong, absolutely unacceptable interpretation because the soul of the text is lost. The soul of the context is lost. Bhagavan Krishna is talking about Dharma, virtue, righteousness, what we call, you know, Punya. But the same Beautiful, one of the glorious, most celebrated lines of Bhagavad Gita can be twisted in such a way. And uh, I forgot to put that picture. Just before I went to Finland, the day before I was arguing with an Ambedkarite group, where you know, they are followers of Ambedkarite and Periyar, Dr. Shyam, he's a Sanskrit scholar. He was trying to justify uh, Udayanidhi Stalin's statement saying that Sanadana Dharma should be eradicated. And his core premise is Sanadana Dharma is nothing but casteism. This is his core argument. Sana'i belongs to a so-called lower 
caste community and he says we have suffered centuries of oppression. This is all because of your Vedas, Itihasa and Puranas. And he quotes, you know, God himself created four different Varnas. Chadur Varnyam, Maya Srishtam, Guna Karma Vibhagasa. And I humbly pointed out, I agree that some of the bad caste practices were in India. Swami Vivekananda rightly called, especially the South and my land, you are a play, you are you are lunatics, and the place you stay is a lunatic asylum because of the horrible caste practices we had. So I said, Dr. Shyam, I appreciate you know, your position, I empathize with it, I support it, but look at the core text, there is no casteism. When you say Chadur Varnyam Maya Srishtam Gunagarma Vibhagasam, Bhagavan Krishna rightly says there are four categories of people, and that is according to the guna and karma. That was there in the ancient Greece. In ancient Greece, there were priests, there were soldiers, there were traders. And this is a system that was in all the you know, older civilizations. But to extrapolate that particular thing and to paint everything as casteis is a strategy used by the hardline Ambedkarites or the hardline Periyarist. Even Periyar went, went ahead to call for the genocide of Brahmins in Tamil Nadu, where he used to say that if you see a Brahmin and a snake, first attack the snake, first attack the Brahmin, then the snake. So these are the hardline interpretation. They purposefully misinterpreted some ways, even though in, in lived experience and fact, we may have had some pockets of casteism, we may have had some issues, but they highlighted in such a way that it was the norm everywhere. The same with the case of Sati, which I was just talking to Rahul Diwanji earlier. Sati, yes, some incidents may have happened, but Jansi Rani, after the death of her husband, she went to fight the British. But purposefully, Sati was used by the Britishers, the missionaries of that age, to paint that women are not free or women are always trapped. See, these are how we take instances to paint an entire legion as bad. Was Sati the norm ever? Absolutely no. If you check the history of South India, one or two instances of women dying after the husbands are uh, recorded, one or two out of a thousand year or thousand five hundred years. But there was no widespread things like this. There were, there might have been some pockets in West Bengal where Raja Ramohandro intervened or in Rajasthan. But they, in order to dehumanize Hindus or demonize Hinduism as a community, one or two instances are taken and we are demonizing the entire Hindu community. Now take the same thing regarding Islam. If we are taking one or two instances or three or four instances or four or five instances from Islamic community's history, and purposefully painting it as bad, we shouldn't be doing it because there are many beautiful and good verses in Quran. There are, yes, there are contentious, debatable contexts in Quran too. I was, uh, you know, learning from one of uh, Neeraji's videos where he was criticizing this particular passage in Quran, where this is one of uh, my good friend Anand Ranganathanji, who I really adore. He is perhaps one of the best speakers, and even though he's a scientist, belongs to more of the ethnic agnostic, atheist kind. I believe he represent Hindu and Dharmic causes in one of the better ways. And I am really an admirer. We disagree on Mahatma Gandhi, but still I am a huge admirer of Anand Ranganathan. He also quotes this passage as many times. The passage is, we will cast terror into the hearts of those who have denied the truth or kafirs. And since they have associated others with Allah in the divinity, something for which he has sent down no sanction. The fire is their abode and how bad the resting place of wrongdoers will be. This is one popular uh, passage of Quran. Many people take and criticize Quran saying that Allah hates kafirs or whatever we call Allah or the God of Quran or God of Islam, God what they believe in uh, Muslims or God of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is intolerant, you know, wants to kill others. But there is a particular context to it. We may not agree with the context, we may not agree with the context, but there is a particular context. So I have taken 3, 3 149 and 3 150, two passages uh, before it. And those are, see, it's a battlefield. It's a battlefield. You know, there are some wars in the history of Islam that deserves mention. For example, Battle of Uhud, Battle of Badr. There are some wars that Prophet Muhammad had fought. Uh, against the people of his place. We can definitely say he was attacking polytheists, that is wrong, because we accept polytheism, but they don't accept polytheism. There are some Jews, uh, I mean, Jewish tribes they were fighting. Muhammad was fighting his own tribe, Qureshi tribe, in which he was born. Yes, there are many fights. On this particular war, the context is, the war is, because Muhammad was suffering setback, uh, the people, the people who are against Muslims or Islam or Prophet Muhammad at that point of time, 
started to say Allah will know, uh, you know he is a false prophet so Allah will not support him that's the reason why or God will not support him that's the reason why he is having this setback so this particular passage was an answer to that where he says or where Quran says no if we uphold what they call dharma not not our definition of dharma what we call dharma dharma rekshadi rekshida if you protect the dharma dharma will protect you if you protect your particular kind of faith or ideology or philosophy or ism that philosophy will protect you and you will be victors at the end yes we can rightly criticize the wars because jesus christ never went to war there are many other prophets who never went to war but prophet muhammad was more of a socio political leader along with being a religious spiritual leader see you can take points where you know you can take his marriage uh, with sufia uh, where you no know, her husband was killed and prophet muhammad you know took her uh, into you know his camp that was you can rightly criticize but there are such instances in every prophets every avatars every person's life if you are taking that particular context out and you no know, uh, and denigrating that is not right that's the reason why rightful criticism should be allowed and that's the thing i believe our hinduism has a our hindu dharma has a great space where we are free to criticize even gods are bound by dharma for example i am a i am a great ardent admirer of our dharma i even name by two kids one is yag uh, from yaga or yagga or yagam as we call in malayalam the second child's name is yug representing yugas i am an ardent admirer of uh, sri rama who i who i look upon as a great maryada purushottam but if we are asked whether uh, sri rama killing bali was the most glorious moment of his life i doubt whether we will be saying that he it was his best moment or he is saying for the larger sake of you uh, know nation or the desha dharma he was ready to sacrifice sita for a larger cause of the nation was this the best decision he ever took i doubt whether we will say it was the best decision so similar questionable decision at that point of time can be raised regarding prophets avatars uh, messengers of god or people who we look upon but the larger point is there is a central message of their teaching there is a central message of their aspects and that should be respected rather than cherry picking on only the negatives and attributing everything uh, muslims do to what prophet did or what islam did there may be points where there are subject to interpretation by one of the beautiful pas passages in quran that i really like which i believe that's there in bible that is there in our literature and every literature and that passage goes like this wala tastavil hasanatu wala sayya itfa'a billati hiya ahsanu faid alladhi bainaka wa bainahu adawatan ka annaho waliyun hami wala tastavil means wala tastavil hasanatu wala sayya means negative and positive are not equal or evil and good are not equal you should uh, it is surah surah fusillat if i am not mistaken it is uh, 431 i'll just check and i'll just check and surah fusillat is the right one so basically it says negativity and positivity are not equal whenever there is negativity we should counter it by positivity whenever there is negative you should counter it by positive and whenever you can do that the enemy will appear enemy will become your good friend this is also also clearly given in many texts like uh, holy bible where they rightly say it is 4134 i beg your pardon sorry so not not for uh, 31 it is 4134 holy quran 4134 surah fusillat where they say positivity should be response to negativity and i would like to conclude by saying that should be our approach there may be trouble passages in every religious book but we should give bhashyas reinterpretation more acceptable interpretation to those things rather than criticizing anything or demonizing any religion as corely wrong or corely bad we should always give a benefit of the doubt we should always appreciate the positive aspects and the living example is we have lived with muslims for centuries altogether middle eastern nations are not showing you know they have islamic nations are they showing any kind of intolerance or other things with us are they showing any kind of things with others i know how many of our people have converted in middle east you know going to muslim nations become muslims or what pressure they faced in middle east nations yes there is an extremist wahhabi if i can use that word wahhabi interpretation and they themselves have suffered and i would like to end by saying 1979 this extremist interpretation ended up with the grand siege of mecca holy mecca was attacked by the al ikhwan wahhabi army and uh, 1970 this occasion is called the grand 
uh, Grand Mecca siege where Holy Mecca was you know, held to a siege by the Al Ikhwan army and at the end uh, Pakistani army and French army had to come with guns and fire at Mecca uh, to you know, uh, exterminate the extremist. So extremism is not right whether it is Hinduism, Christianity or Islam. Some passages we can definitely criticize but branding any religion as totally intolerant or evil or bad will be an antithesis to the Vishwaguru stature uh, India and Hindu community will be having. We believe in or we should believe in synthesis, synergy, acceptance of various strands and that is the reason why Swami Vivekananda rightly pointed out. We not only you know tolerate different religions. You know, Swami Vivekananda was asked about toleration. He said we do not believe in toleration. We believe in acceptance and celebration of, celebration of all religions because all religions are different and varied paths to God. And I would like to conclude by saying it is not that our religion is same. All religions are different and varied paths to God and we should be accepting and respecting while being ready to intellectually criticize them. Okay, before I start with my presentation, I will take up a few points which Rahulji has very eloquently mentioned. One is he has I think three times quoted Swami Vivekananda. I will try to quote Swami Vivekananda himself. He said that most of the Muslims in India are perverts by the sword and they must be brought back into Hindu fold because every Hindu going out of Hindu fold is not only a Hindu less but an enemy more. That is what he thought, that is what he unequivocally stated and that should tell us what Swami Vivekananda thought about Islam. Then Rahulji has talked about a varied interpretation, context and subtext. We will come to that also. And one point which he very eloquently emphasized was that we have been coexisting with Muslims for a very long time. So why cannot we do that in future? That would be just like saying that we, let us say I am the CEO of a company and I am saying that I have been in business, I used to have 100% or 80% of the market share, today I have 20% of the market share but I am still existing. Why I am saying so is because Afghanistan used to be Hindu, Pakistan used to be Hindu, Bangladesh used to be Hindu, Kashmir used to be Hindu, we have lost all of them, some of them for good. So when we are saying we have coexisted with Muslims for such a long time, we are making a very wrong statement. And just to give you a few facts, in 1947, the Hindu Sikh population in Pakistan was about 23% which is now less than 2%. This is not coexistence. Islam is gobbling up all the non-Muslims in Pakistan, an area which was totally Hindu. Bangladesh, population of Hindus was 27% in 1947. Now it is less than 7%. Now 7% and 28% probably does not give us the correct context. but when you translate it into numbers, it comes into crores. Just think of crores people being wiped out, crores of girls being raped, uh, snatched away from their families, forcibly converted and then put into the harems of men who are old enough to be their grandfathers. This is a gradual slow genocide which is taking place but we are here saying that we have been living with Muslims for such a long time Therefore, we should be tolerant. We should respect it. We can respect Muslims because there they can be good Muslims, there can be bad Muslims. But Islam has only one way street. When I was giving the example of Hamas, that was because this was just in, the, it has been in the news and it is in the recent memory of all of us. But the modus operandi as I had already mentioned remains the same. A true Muslim is supposed to act according to Muhammad and the names are different all over the world. It is Boko Haram, it is Al-Qaeda, it is ISIS. Now ISIS is what? Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. jaish e Muhammad, followers Muhammad, Hezbollah, Hezbollah, Party of Allah. Just, just check out the names, what are they doing? When we are trying to falsely equate them with the verses of a shlok of Bhagavad Gita, do you see Bhagavad Gita chanting Hindu terrorists going out and beheading people, raping women? We don't. But we see 
thousands of Islamic terrorists quoting Quranic verses, killing, beheading, torturing, raping. This is false equivalent, false equivalence, and uh, not a very good idea, I must say. Okay, then uh, he mentioned about burning of Quran, and uh, uh, Rahuji very eloquently said that our Prime Minister also did not support burning of Quran. Now look at the context of Sweden. It's a sovereign country. They have their own constitution, they have their own laws. The person who burnt Quran, he took the permission from the required authorities, followed the due, followed the due procedure of law. Then he burnt the Quran, which their constitution permits, because that is exactly what right of freedom of expression means. When we talk of right of freedom of speech, this right is required when you have to say unpleasant things. If I have to say pleasant things, I don't require any right that anybody can do. Suppose I have to praise Rahul Devan, he, he'll give me a platform, come over here, probably he'll pay me also that come over here and appreciate me, praise me. The right is required, the might of the state is required when you are permitted to say things which are not pleasant. And that is what that guy was doing when he was burning Quran. A book which talks about killing me, a book which talks about raping my family, a book which talks about beheading me. I, I cannot respect it. I will dislike it. And that was one way of expressing that he was burning the Quran. And you know, in the United Nations, who uh, forwarded the proposal? Pakistan forwarded the proposal and we shamelessly seconded it. We should not have done it. That is a sovereign nation. They are following their laws and here we are supporting them. So anyway, that was besides the point. Now I'll come to my presentation here. Rahulji said that we should not take four or five historical instances out of contacts because we've been living with, with them for so long and every religion can be good, every religion can be bad. Before the advent of Islam, India was a center of educational excellence. Students from all over the world used to come over here. And when they came, they wrote their very detailed chronicles. Last one of them was Fahin and some of his, uh, within that span of 40-50 years, there were many other. All of them were praising highly what was present in India. But once the ingress of Islam started, that flow of students ended. And we started on the downward path, on the downward spiral we started going. Now, what changed? Till that time, the entire Middle East today, the entire uh, Eastern part, that was Buddhist. What happened to those Buddhists? Where did they go? They did not vanish in thin air. They were very brutally butchered and converted into Islam. Then after that, what started happening was, after the death of Muhammad, they started expanding throughout the world. Now, I am not going to talk about isolated incidents. I'll try, try, I'll try to share with you the chronology of what has been happening over here. Now, this is a slide which, just let us read a few words. Shortly after Abu Musa Ashari, who had been one of the companions of Prophet. Uh, I'll give you the context. When the Prophet had died, the first Khalifa was Abu Bakr. He died after two years. Then the second Khalifa was Umar. He started attacks for, on India. And the first attack that took place, the commander was one person known as Mughira. And then there was other uh, whose commander was Budal. Both of the those commanders were killed. The armies were repaired back. Here, what are they discussing? Look at the last portion which is highlighted. Holy war with that country. The governor in Iraq sent the message to Umar that the Indians are very great fighters. We've already lost campaigns. So don't think about invading that country with your jihad. First documented evidence. And what is he talking about? Talking about Hind. Uh, now, this is in 630s. After that, the major ingress was by Muhammad bin Qasim. I'm skipping it for the shortage of time. I'll switch over to uh, Mahmud Ghaznavi. When he came, in his train was his chronicler. His name was al -Biruni. This is his book, Kitab al-Hind. What is he telling us about Mahmud Ghaznavi? 
This prince chose the holy war as his calling and therefore called himself Al Ghazi, that is, warrior on the road of Allah, which is known as Jihad fi Sabilillah. In the interest of his successors, he constructed an order to weaken the Indian frontier, those roads on which afterwards his son, Yaminudullah Mahmud, marched into India during a period of 30 years and more. Now notice the next words God be merciful to both father and son. Mahmud utterly ruined the prosperity of the country and performed their wonderful exploits by which the Hindus became like atoms of dust scattered in all directions. Do you feel any remorse here? Try to connect the dots. When Hamas terrorists are gleeful, here again that glee is being shown when Hindus are being scattered like atoms of dust. And this is thousand years ago. Then this is Tariqi Yamini, his own autobiography. The prosecution of holy wars. He is coming into Hind. What is he doing? He took all the property they contained into his own possession and captured cities in Hind, which had up to that time been tenanted only by infidels and not trodden by the camels and horses of Muslims. It is not ordinary fight between two kings. It is fight between Islam and Kuffar. Thousand years ago. Yaminudullah Aminul Millat, the friend of the Amir Mumineen. Now what happened was, the Khalifa had said that you are going to be our vice regent in India. And that is what he is saying, professing his allegiance to the successor of the Prophet of God, which means Khalifa. And look at the last line, vowed that every year he would undertake a holy war against him. Notice the common strands over here. Allegiance to the Khalifa. And if you've read today's newspapers, what is the front news? What is the headline? 15 Muslims have been arrested by NIA for doing what? For trying to wage jihad against the government of India. And these people had declared a village somewhere around Thane as Islamic region. It was, uh, and he said that this is out of bound for uh, Indians. The name he gave was Al-Sham, which is the name of Syria. This is what is happening now. This is what was happening thousand years ago. Try to connect the dots. When we say we've existed with Muslims peacefully for thousands of years. And he had taken vow to uh, perpetuate jihad on Hind. And that is what today's newspaper is also saying. Next major ingress was by Muhammad Ghori. What is his? What are his documents saying? After dwelling on the advantages and necessity of holy war, without which the fold of Muhammad's flock could never be filled, he says that such a hero as these obligations of religion require has been found. And now I'll just shift over quickly. The pole of the world and religion, the pillar of Islam and Muslims, the asylum of princes and sultans and destroyer of infidels and plural worshippers. Do you see this kind of hatred by any other religion except Islam and Christianity? No, we don't. Then Qutubuddin Ebak. Qutubuddin, Qutubuddin Ebak pursued him and when the wretch was taken, his head was severed from his body. Now he is killing somebody. But what is important for us is written accounts of his capture of forts and strongholds and his victories and holy wars. This is perpetual jihad which is going since that time. Sultan, now we come to Alauddin Khilji, which is about two at a gap of more than 100 years. Sultan Alauddin advanced against him at the head of a large army for the purpose of carrying on a holy war, actuated by pure faith, sincere intentions and hope of resurrection and the determination to bring destruction on the infidels with a view of holy war and not for the lust of conquest. When he went to Khambayat, which is known as Kambay now, and the idolaters were awakened from their sleepy state of carelessness. Now try to compare it with what Hamas did. And the idolaters were awakened from their sleepy state of carelessness and were taken by surprise, not knowing where to go. And mothers forgot their children and dropped them from their embrace. The Mohammedan forces began to kill and slaughter on the right and on the left unmercifully throughout the impure land for the sake of Islam. 
and blood flowed in torrents. They plundered gold and silver to an extent, blah, blah, blah. Does any other religion write these things and then enjoy these things? No. This is what is happening right now. Then move further ahead. They took captive a great number of handsome and elegant maidens amounting to 20,000 and children of both sexes. What is Israel doing? They captured a few girls. A few girls is again an insert to even a single girl. But here we are talking of thousands of girls which were taken by them for sex slavery, for concubinage. Muhammadan army brought the country to utter ruin. This is not being written by any third party, by the way. This is being written by Muslims themselves. Muhammadan army brought the country to utter ruin and destroyed the lives of the inhabitants and plundered the cities and captured their offspring so that many temples were deserted and the idols were broken and trodden underfoot, the largest of which was one called Somnath. Sultan Alauddin gave orders that the sword of menace and declaration of unity should be offered to them when as they could not help themselves, they placed their heads on the line of Islam. This is forcible conversion. And repeated the profession of Muhammadan creed, which is La ilaha illallah. Alauddin honored and gave preferment to Ali Beg. Then go ahead at the underline portion. Order was issued by Alauddin to gather together the heads of those who had been slain. This matter was specially made over to the Hindus. On counting them after they were thrown at the feet of the holy warriors, they were found to be amount to 60,000. 60,000 heads were severed and a pile was created. At the feet of what? Jihadis, Mujahideen. Now let us go to 1398 when Tem Timur Lehm is coming, Tamur Lang is coming. What is he stating? Let us read that also. This is in his own biography, Malfusti Timuri. Fit for making wearing apparel and aromatic plants and the sugarcane. It is a country which is always green and verdant and the whole aspect of the country is pleasant and delightful. Now, since the inhabitants are chiefly polytheists and infidels and idolaters and worshippers of the sun, by order of Allah and his prophet, it is right for us to conquer them. This is not a fight between two kings. This is fight of Islam with non-Islamic world. Then what does he say? My object in the invasion of Hindustan is to lead an expedition against the infidels that according to the law of Muhammad, we may convert to the true faith the people of that country and purify the land itself from the filth of infidelity and polytheism and that we may overthrow their temples and idols and become Ghazis and Mujahids before Allah. They gave an unwilling consent, but I placed no reliance upon them. At this time, the wise men of Islam came before me. And a conversation began about the propriety of a war against infidels and polytheists. Then what happens is, I'll just read the relevant portion. And it is the duty of every Muslim and true believer to use his utmost exertions in the obedience of his ruler when the edifying words of the wise men reached the ears of the nobles all their hearts were set upon a holy war in Hindustan and throwing themselves on their knees they repeated the chapter of victory so the chants that you see today on television Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar that is what was happening in Farghana in Samarkand 600 years ago okay now let us come to specifics. What is the end goal that Islam wants to achieve? They want to convert entire world into Muslims, into Islamic world, which, is, which they call as Darul Islam. That would mean if today the population is 800 billion, they are trying to convert 600 billion people to Islam. Is that going to be peaceful? Has Kashmir been peaceful? Has our partition been peaceful? Just try to think about that. Then you will know the context that how people resist. Try to remember what happened with Sambhaji Maharaj. Try to remember what happened with Guru Tegh Bahadur, with the sons of Guru Tegh Bahadur. This is just a portion from Masiri Alamgiri written, by Auran, written for Aurangzeb by his own Muslim chroniclers. What are they saying? 
the emperor out of his devotion to islam ordered that from two course before the camp the disgraced and unlucky sambha should be made to wear a wooden cap and his comrades should be clad in the dress of buffoons punished in various ways mounted on camels and brought to the encampment and the darbar with drums beating and trumpets pealing so that muslims might be heartened and infidels disheartened by seeing it the night preceding the morning on which he was brought to the court was without exaggeration the shabe barat because nobody slept till morning for the pleasure of seeing the spectacle and what was the spectacle what they are talking about it was like eid for them you know how sambhaji was killed yes. this is a painting by moguls themselves sambhaji is being brought on a camel he has been specifically put on funny clothes so that he looks like a clown then he is taken to the butcher where he is cut into pieces and his flesh is being fed to the dogs this is the religion of peace in action for you this is from a gurdwara where they are showing the modern devices modern scientific inventions which are being used to perpetrate or perpetuate perpetuate the hegemony of islam they were put in boiling oil to be killed if they did not convert to islam scholar bhai mani singh his fingers were chopped then his arms were chopped then his feet were chopped and ultimately he was beheaded bhai mati das he was sawn from middle when he was alive bhai taru singh his skull was removed when he was still alive madhu das bairagi what whom we call banda singh bahadur he was his skin was peeled off by iron hot pincers his 3 year old son was cut in front of him his heart was taken out and it was force fed fed to banda bahadur does it look like religion of peace to all of you because that is what the end goal of islam is that is what they want to do and if th- these are isolated incidents i have given you a picture from 634 to 2023 more than 1400 years any ideology which for 1400 years shows this butchery this intolerance in such a large ge- geographical area i have not talked about what they did to christians then can you say that it is few isolated incidents something taken out of context no all of them were scholars of quran in fact i just uh, missed to show you when uh, imerlaim had to come he opened quran to find out an omen and he saw the verse which said told him that go and kill the kafirs does it look like religion of peace to you I think the time is over. I'll rest my case over here. Thank you. We now have comments from both of you, but before you both do that, I have my own notes. And so you will I request both of you to take some notes and perhaps in your comments also take my arguments. In some cases I am I'm going to be arguing Neeraj ji on uh, behalf of Rahul Ishwar ji and in other cases uh, from Neeraj ji side to you or perhaps even from my side to you i sometimes lose my neutrality so the first point i have here is you said uh, neera jatri ji that the book is talking about killing me yeah. as a kafir yeah. he is saying oh this is context of war 1400 years ago yeah. right while he accepted that this is kafir but it is context of war so please do clarify that 15 muslims you said waging war today's news against jihad against india he is already sort of answered that saying that this is ultra right orthodox people who interpret things wrongly they are bad people it has nothing to do with religion see quran has a total of 6236 verses out of those more than 3910 that means more than 60% of verses are directly or indirectly about non muslims and kafirs and almost all of them are derogatory to kafirs and out of those 3910 verses there are hundreds which talk about killing or mistreating the kafirs which i definitely am for example i can say verse 95 which is very famous the verse of the sword so there is no ambiguity no doubt that there are very clear verses in quran 
which say that kafirs should be killed they are not to be spared yeah but this is context of war okay now to answer that verse 95 is the ninth chapter is one of the last chapters of quran and when its first 39 verses are known as discharge or release at that time there was no war going on muhammad had already uh, captured mecca he was living in medina he had sent some of his companions on a hajj or umrah i don't remember it was on one pilgrimage that he sent it was a time of peace he was staying in medina and then he dispatched his uh, cousin ali that you go there and when because when people used to go to makka there used to be congregations in those congregations some announcements used to be made now since he was a de facto ruler of makka he sent that these latest verses have come from allah towards me and these are going to be announced so point number 1 is there was no war at that point of time and that is when all these 91 to 939 verses came out out of which 95 which is verse of sword which i am going to show you this is one there was no war secondly it is said that it was to be done at the time of prophet itself now i have shown you a continuous history from the time of the first khalifa to present day that it is still going on because if had it been for that time they would have junked those verses at that time quran would become redundant in that case the mere fact that they say it is the word of allah it is valid for all point all times to come at all places it is universally applicable this is just to fool non muslims that it was meant for that time thank you neeraj ji rahul ji exactly in exactly this point um, i was talking to an ex muslim in an interview recently and i brought up this point that this is context of war and his point is wonderful let muslims all over the world accept this fact that this is a story book which is compiled which tells a story of the war and all the ayats and whatever was revealed to the prophet of islam uh, during that time it is irrelevant today verses may be irrelevant today and is certainly not a book for all times to come till the last judgment day all these are irrelevant let the muslim say it uh, one of the points here a uh, clear point here is that one of the pillars of islam to be a believer you have to believe in the last day of judgment so is the quran uh, in your view a book which will la- which is relevant till the last judgment day or is it only context of war and should be ignored no religion or no religious book you know can be eternal in the sense of one interpretation that's the reason why people like swami rengadanand ananda right he says there are eternal values and there is a changing society eternal values are there changing society is there every religious book not only quran but you know bible or torah or our hindu text there are some values which we can rightly call as eternal sanatana the core philosophical values there is a social context that happens for example leftist attack saying that no pida rakshati kaumare bharto rakshati yuvane putro rakshati varthake na stri swadandra marhadi it was that context that manu wrote maybe it was hundreds or thousands of years ago but you know i don't defend quran as a believer but i defend quran as a literature as a historical book as the revelation or what prophet muhammad saw as his own divine revelations just like many other books are so even in this particular context of 95 as neeraj ji rightly said it was not in the context of a war the verse goes like this after the sacred months have passed if there are polytheist and the context is the breaking of the treaty when the pagans or you know, what they used to call pagans or what they used to go polytheist are going to break our treaty then find them attack them even that is not acceptable for me but what i am saying is that is not the core of islam the core of islam or core of any religion is not war war might have happened for example it is as similar to saying that see bhagavad gita is a great book regarding karma yoga jnana yoga raj yoga bhakti yoga way to salvation but if you are only reducing it to the mahabharata work and not seeing the larger context then it is not uh, right for us to do for example there was an atheist in one of the atheist conference who asked me don't you think bhagavad gita is boring i said you are the first person who said so because world over people who even oppose bhagavad gita say it is a marvelous work his answer was when there are so many armies ready to fight krishna was advising arjuna for so long so the others might have felt bored 
I said, sir, that is a symbolic way of telling. It's the battle of life. It is the battle of Kurikshetra of life. So it's a context that is taken. Please remember, these words have changed meaning over centuries, context over centuries. The action can be misconstrued over centuries. And a, a small example I can give is, I don't think anybody here will support child marriage. Will anyone of us support child marriage? People who are age of 11 or 12 or 13, we won't support it. Mahatma Gandhi last century had a child marriage. Do we mean to say that Mahatma Gandhi was a bad person because he had a child marriage? Just 100 years back, the social context was so different. Then what about 1500 years back? What about thousands of years back when Manu wrote? So my answer to it would be, we should be having an empathetic, respectful understanding of the context. We can strongly disagree. Even if somebody breaks the treaty, that is not a reason for them to kill. That is not a reason them to force Jasiya. That is not a reason to do anything. But having said that, the context is of breaking the treaty. The context is not religious hatred. The context is not. For example, even Aniraji, I saw him one context regarding the poisoning of Prophet Muhammad. And there are multiple interpretations, but according to the believers, which I learned for this debate, Prophet Muhammad also forgave the Jewish woman who gave him the poison. He nearly, he got, you know, he died only four years after the incident of poisoning happened. One Jew you know, who was taken captive, uh, gave in a goat's meat poison to Prophet Muhammad. So, you know, her justification was interesting. He said, if I am giving you the poison and you are escaping or you are surviving it, you are the prophet of God. If you are giving you the poison and you are dying, you are a king that we should get rid of. That's the reason why I gave you poison. So, why do, why do we divorce the particular context in which it says? And I agree with Neeraj is one very important thing. Yes, we have suffered. We means Indians have suffered in a big way. People like Will Durant, who is a you know, impartial historian, he called the Muhammad invasion the bloodiest story in human history. It is not only in India, the most horrific story in human history, he said. But can we live in history? Can the Muslims of today be held responsible to what happened to Muhammad Gauri, what done by Muhammad Gauri or Ghesni or Islamic Sultanates? For example, in my state, home state Kerala, Muslims came as traders, not as invaders. They were happy with the you know, South Indian ecosystem for a very long period of time. So is it right to paint all of them? Yes, it was a very horrible invasion that happened. Temples were destroyed. These are all documented pieces of history. But does that mean we destroy the mosques back? Are we not uh, bringing down to the level of invaders when we are going to raise their mosque or when we are bent upon attacking? Yes, we have been attacked. There is no doubt. If I can take one or two minutes uh, to present that too. For example, I think Swami Vivekananda is a person you know, who can be agreeable to the most of Indians, including the leftists who respect him for the intellectual honesty he has. Perhaps the greatest, one of the greatest Hindu philosophers who redefined Hindu community for us. This is Vivekananda in Future of India, one of the lectures where he told. He speaks about and he says something very important. After all, not nothing is all bad and nothing is all good. That is the crux of the philosophical position Vivekananda had. Regarding Islamic rule, it was a great Hindu philosopher Vivekananda who said, even the Mohammedan rule, we owe that great blessing, the, the destruction of exclusive privilege for Brahmins and upper caste people. The rule, after all, not all bad. Nothing is all bad and nothing is all good. And then you know, he goes on. The Mohammedan conquest of India came as a salvation for the downtrodden, for the poor. This is not an Islamic scholar speaking. This is not some Muslim apologist speaking. This is the greatest of Hindu Indian philosophers who redefined India in the modern way. One of the greatest teachers of Vedanta speaking, Vivekananda goes, the Mohammedan conquest of India came as a salvation to the downtrodden, to the poor. That is why one-fifth of our people have become Muslims or Mohammedans. It was not the sword that did it all. It was not the sword that did it all. It would be the height of madness to think it was all the work of sword and fire. This was Swami Vivekananda saying, yes, some forced conversions were there. I keep on telling, you know, I'm, a, I'm an ardent Mahatma Gandhi follower or a Gandhi. Yet. But even Mahatma Gandhi's son was subjected to forced conversion by Islam. Even or Islam or Islamist, I beg your pardon. Mahatma Gandhi's son, Harilal, became Abdullah Gandhi and Mahatma Gandhi wrote it. The, the, the letter there is in Times of India published, where Mahatma Gandhi himself says, he has not gone for any spiritual pursuits, but for other reasons. And the people who converted Mahatma Gandhi's son had ulterior political you know, motives. They wanted to divide Hindus and Muslims. They want to weaken our national movement. Even Mahatma Gandhi's son was forcefully converted and later he came back. He became Abdullah Gandhi and later he became Harilal Gandhi. Harilal Abdullah Gandhi, he came back. So yes, 
Forced conversions are a very serious issue. I totally agree with Neeraj ji. We need to have something like an anti-forced conversion law, which we have been trying very much, you know, for in our state. You know, Kerala, it is very tough because the LF government is there. But some anti-forced conversion law should definitely be there. We Hindus are by structure not very organized. So we are more prone to attack. I agree with Neeraj ji on that point, especially predatory conversionism or Islamism in that way. But shouldn't we distinguish Islam and Islamism? Shouldn't we distinguish Islam, which is a religion, with Islamism, which is a political ideology, who is power hungry, who want to uproot India, who has an agenda by 2050 to uproot democracy from India, as discovered by NIA. There should be a difference between the extremists and the moderates. There should be a difference between the Islamists and Islam. There should be a difference between the conversionists and Christians. So this is one thing I would like to submerge. And yes, India was one of the greatest nation in the world. We can say with pride. But shouldn't we have the honest introspection and also say many of our backward communities suffered, many of our so-called lower caste, I know we don't believe in the idea, you know, word of lower caste, but so-called lower communities have suffered in India's history. We had untouchability, we had our own issues. That's the space where great Baba Sahib Ambedkar came, Mahatma Bhule came, Mahatma Gandhi came, Swami Vivekananda came, all our reformers came. So we also had our own share of problems. What if? You know, our backward communities turn back and say, it is time to take revenge on you. If we are going to take revenge on Muslims for all the atrocities some of their forefathers did, what if the backward communities turn back and say that we are going to take revenge on you for the you know, bad things that you have done? And this is again Vivekananda. For our own motherland, a junction of two great systems, Hinduism and Islam, Vedanta brain and Islamic body, not my words, Vivekananda's words, Vedanta brain and Islamic body, I see in my mind, mind's eye, the future perfect India arising out of chaos and strife, glorious and invincible with Vedanta brain and Islamic body. See, together along with Muslims, Hindus and Muslims, we defeated the greatest empire in human history. Two are the largest empires in human history. One belonged to Chinggis Khan and one was the British Empire. We together, yes, partition was absolutely horrible. Lakhs of Hindus were killed. There were a lot of issues. Nobody is denying that. Similarly, you know, things, our Sikh brothers, suffered. Things have happened, but nobody is saying, you know, it was all hunky and dory. But the point is, can we take revenge on history? Can we keep on perpetuating the wounds of our past? This is one thing we will have to consider. Somewhere healing should happen, right? We have 20 to 25 crore Muslims in India. Are we going to stigmatize them at every count? And one more thing, please don't think I am, I mean, many of my, our friends and even Muslims and leftists, when they call me for seminars, they misunderstand that I am secular. I am absolutely anti-secular. I, I don't agree with neither Congress secularism, I don't agree with BJP's genuine secularism. Because secularism itself is a disease. It's a bad, there is nothing called a good disease. But we should have a pluralistic framework. We should proudly say that we are Hindus, we are Indians, we should uphold our dharmic identity, but Otherwise, we will end up in chaos. We will end up in civil war. Although, if we are not finding common grounds of unity, a sense of balance, a sense of moderation, where are we going to end up? So, my only humble submission in my last minute would be, we have to find a middle ground consensus where we can definitely vouch for Ram Temple. We can, I don't know whether you have seen, have strongly argued for the Kashi and Madhura case. But if you are going to end up arguing for 30,000 more temples, and you know, revocation of places of worship act that will unleash riots in this nation. I don't want my children to live in an India where there are riots. Yes, some temples are sacrosanct. We need it back. Absolutely. You, we shouldn't dilute. I never dilute. I always argue for Kashi, Mathura. There are many temples. We should try to get it back because they are dharmic centers and hold special significance. But that shouldn't. I am not like the leftists who say, let us forget temples and most, let us build hospitals and schools. I mean, that's an easy way of uh, confusing us Hindus and you know, creating a, a distraction. But somewhere it has to stop. Somewhere it has to end. You cannot you know, go on endlessly taking revenge. And I would like to end by saying one important thing even Anubhavji was mentioning in the beginning. There is a serious issue of fertility rate, demographic change, you know, that is happening. But the Muslim fertility rate is 2.5 to 2.6 or 2.7 in many places or less than 3. Hindu fertility rate is the issue. For example, in Kerala where I have studied extensively, Hindu fertility rate is 1.3. Christian fertility rate or fertility rate means a number of children per a woman, number of children per family. Muslims are 2.7. That is acceptable rate within 2 or 3. 
demographic changes are happening because we have internal issues not because muslims are there not because muslims are outnumbering us we are decreasing ourselves we need a stable fertility rate and all these issues i agree you no know, uh, with with him but the core submission is it is about upholding a pluralistic framework while acknowledging the hindu issues proudly upholding and wearing our hindu dharma on our sleeves but not making muslim an enemy that is a distraction that is a waste of time and that should be done and i would end with this slide itself christianity also says only my god is true and you are wrong islamic hardliners and christian hardliners say my you no know, i have an exclusive queue to god should we say back you no know, my hindu religion is only right and you are all going to hell do you believe a hindu can ever say that let alone let alone anyone do you can you imagine any hindu standing back up and telling a muslim see only my god krishna is right only my god rama or ayappa or anybody is right and you are all going to hell that is not in our nature we should not go down to the islamist hardline or the christian hardline and say that my religion is the only religion rather we should teach christians and muslims or even their moderates and the other people to uphold a pluralist framework that point already you yeah. conceded a point when you said one? we should not fall to their level that correct correct this is so, so this is this in is fact, in, so in fact actually you are that it, they are not deviation a of on uh, if i may actually please, hold please. you to my questions so there is a quotation by thomas thomas sowell a great black american intellectual in the us those who say that all cultures are equal never explain why the results of those cultures are grossly so grossly unequal Uh, there are about i don't know 6 700 perhaps more terrorist organizations listed around the world 98 99% of them are muslim uh, have a muslim name yeah. this is un 60 or can, so can i just uh, uh, no, in, this is the lie that leftists are telling us this is all culture no 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 not i'm, I'm not telling you i'm i'm saying what you said is right yeah. all religions are not equal all cultures are not equal so they are different than unique and we should respect them wonderful so see this is the line the other line is a leftist lie so meaning to subjugate hindu saying that all religions are But equal that no. is not the point of this so see. much the results are grossly unequal we have to judge the quality of the culture or the religion on the outcomes not on the consequences that we have to we face. can take a solid example of uae which is an islamic nation they have a they are opening temple there our modi ji went there i think sri sri ravi shankar ji two days Ram, back was there the, the mere fact that you have to mention it as an example of their tolerance tells us that this is an exception well, what and, about and what that, about other middle east nations so sure. what about Maybe indonesia the, where they have currency of indonesia as a hindu past and a hindu culture where you know the obama even has a ganesha in his hand they have ganapati's picture in their yeah. currency note indonesia is the largest muslim nation in the world yeah so these are some examples which are there neeraj ji which see, are often see, quoted yeah, malaysia for example see, is what not happens this is, what happens is here the trick is that they try to portray as if the entire islamic world is a monolith it is not it originated in saudi arabia now a relative of mine he was posted in saudi arabia he went started working there and then he wanted to take his wife along so she will get bored he thought okay what i'll do is i'll take a hard disk of 2 tb uh cram it with the latest tv series and what she likes and she'll be able to watch it at her player the moment they reached the airport the hard disk was taken from them and they they said that in islam these things are forbidden so we will not permit you now islam is not applied uniformly throughout the world we have to understand this we cannot keep on shifting the Uh, goal post that when we have to talk about moderation then we give the example of malaysia and when we have to say that they are also tolerating us because ua is doing what we are doing is we are cherry picking it and exceptions in fact prove the rule why is the latest uh, the first cinema hall opening up in kashmir right now because as long as isra islam was ruling the roost over there they don't permit it so what we need now a few points which he said was when is swami vivekananda see today's discussion is about islam no islamic scholar will consider swami vivekananda as an authority on islam and swami vivekananda's word does not carry any weight when you're talking of islam he is not an authority of islam point number 1 then uh, he said that the prophet forgave the lady who gave her poison we have hundreds of examples where he got women killed just because 
she said a few sentences about Muhammad. There was this poetess, 80 years old. He tore her from middle by tying her to the feet of camels. So let us not cherry pick these things. What we have to understand is, like you rightly point, were pointing out, we must talk about the outcome, the consequences which are taking place. We are losing territory. We are losing people. We are daily losing our young men on the border because we are talking about in just, just one example of Pakistan army. What is the motto of Pakistan army? Jihad fi sabilillah. Iman, taqwa and jihad fi sabilillah. And on daily basis, we are losing our young men because we are not taking the problem of Islam, Islamic jihad, Islamic kital head on. And I guess, I think every army man should be alarmed for this. We are sending our young men as cannon fodder, but we are not telling them that this is not a geopolitical problem. This is a theopolitical problem. May I challenge is, you over there, Neeraji? Yeah, please do. So that. all the examples you gave of Sambhaji Maharaj being uh, hmm. torn to pieces yeah. and Mahmood, Ghaznavi, Gauri, Aurangzeb, yeah. all of these are pathetic kings. They are like ISIS, but they are those kings. Why blame all today's Muslims for those horrible kings? Because Wonderful. supposedly all kings around the world have done this. I do want to bring up the example of Temur Lane. I'm being a devil's advocate hmm. here. I'm yeah, speaking yeah, yeah. from Rahul yeah. Ishwarji's point of view. Yeah. Um, Temur Lane, if I'm not wrong, actually has the credit or discredit or whatever you may call it of killing the largest number of Muslims anybody has, perhaps other than Chinggis Khan. And he, before every war he waged, even on Baghdad, for example, he prayed, including with his whole armies, offered a namaz and then went and killed the maximum amount of Muslims. So the point I'm making is they, they use an invocation of Allah, just like two warring armies in India, perhaps would use, one would use Krishna, one would use Kali and wage war against each other. That is the argument. Okay. So what you're saying is that it is a fight between kings and they've been killing Muslims also, right? There is a very specific term for such Muslims and that is Munafik. Any Muslim who does not participate in Jihad is known as a Munafik and he is treated at par with Kafirs. His punishment is also the same because this argument is very frequently quoted that see the terrorism in Kashmir is political in nature because so many Kashmiri Muslims are being killed over there. What we have to remember is that a very entrenched concept is of Munafik over there that anyone who does not fight for the hegemony of Islam is a Munafik. It is again written in Quran. I'll, there are at least 10 verses which talk about Munafik and they can also be killed. They should also be killed and that is exactly what they are doing. Now coming back to the fight of the kings, if we are trying to equate, uh, again it is a false equivalence, the reason for that is, the reason for that is that they are taking their inspiration from Quran from nothing else. For example, when you are talking about Tamur Lang also, here I have in front of me his statement, in this matter I sought an omen from the Quran and the verse to which I opened was this, O Prophet, make war upon the infidels and unbelievers and treat them with severity, right? So, since Quran is available to them, Quran talks them up about killing non-Muslims, non so it is going to be used over there. We are going to look at the consequences and these are all consequences which are stemming from the Islamic theology. Can I, can I just add one line to it? In the past 10 years, if you see maximum number of suicide bombings, which everyone agrees is wrong, has happened from Muslim community itself. There is no debate. I don't think even any Muslim will debate. But who did they kill? Shias kill Sunnis. Sunnis kill Shias. More than India, even Pakistani schools were bombed. Not by, not by as they call RSS, because of Islamophobia. See, is but an, in, Rahul, it is an inter-class rivalry. Rahulji, uh, I must stop you. Because yeah. this is an argument made on TV very often. But what is the point here? Yes, they are killing Muslims. The point is, it is not theological. So the point is, it is not the, the core point is when Sunnis bomb Shias, Shias bomb Sunnis. When the Sunnis don't even allow Ahmadiyas, who they see as outcasts. It is theological. It According is between to, them, right? It is not regarding Kafir. I don't think. Yes, but Sunnis between could, them, they end up. You want to see, take this yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This this concept is known as takfir, in which one Muslim calls the other one a Kafir and then he kills him, and that is even in fact that in fact proves my point that Islam is not a religion of peace. That's the point. I mean, yes. with due respect, that if that is theological, it can be directed against others. 
when Sunnis and Shias are bombing each other, can we tell so? And coming to the army, we, I totally agree with the point of losing territory and all of it, just take 30 seconds. But who is one of the greatest military heroes India has produced? He destroyed six Pakistani battle tanks. His name was Paramira Chakra Abdul Hamid, perhaps the most celebrated of India's warriors. He was given Paramir Chakra and our army general was magnanimous enough to touch the feet of his widow, Rasul and Bivi. No, see, intervene just, just one line, I'll conclude. So, he is a soldier who fought and died for us. He is a Muslim. What about Abdul Kalam's father? He was a Maulavi or an Imam in a no, remote village in Tamil Nadu. He is also inspired by Quran. I mean, his father is also inspired by Quran. Abdul Kalam is richly inspired by Indian text and Hindu have, text. Uh, sorry, but sorry. Can we say that Rahul, he's, he Rahul is an Ji. extremist? Rahul Ji, you have to give citation to this. Abdul Kalam's father is, a, is an imam in the mosque. I mean, that's it. Really? That Abdul Hamid was inspired by Quran. No, I'm not saying Abdul Hamid yes. was inspired so, by Quran. So that is exactly I'm saying the Abdul point. Kalam's father. No, no, fair enough. But Abdul Hamid, whether was he a practicing Muslim, yes or no? Was he following the Quran, yes or no? As an example, we had a debate a session yesterday where uh, an, a retired uh, Navy officer, Commander uh, Harinder Sikha, actually did not know anything about Guru Nanak. And he started learning only after his retirement. That is how the nature of the army is. They have served Dharm Mandir, everybody goes yeah. everywhere because they are trained in that. So to cite uh, uh, Abdul Hamid example is actually a... I mean, I'm, I'm not saying Abdul Hamid is inspired by Quran. I said no, Abdul no. Kalam's father. But it's, and but my only point is, is what you said. The point we is shouldn't the alienate he... Abdul Hamid who is ready to die for us and fight for us oh. by saying that he is a Muslim. By saying that, you know, he is a person on the other side. So I will uh, state this. Sorry. The point is, the debate here is not, are all Muslims violent? Hmm. We are debating whether Islam is a religion of peace. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. And how do how do we see that? You by seeing so, the examples. By yeah. see, I mean, I, I see rightly told there are negative examples, there are positive examples. I don't think anybody in their right mind will say Maulana Abul Kalam Asad was a separatist. He wanted to fight for a united India. No, until no, every time he failed. That's a different thing. He and Mahatma Gandhi failed. He was a Quran Pandit, a Quran scholar. And I he was a Maulana. I will challenge you there please, also. Please. Because he actually goes on record to say that it is in benefit of for the Islamic cause to uh, to further the Islamic cause that India remains united. Because he knew that Muslims would be much reduced in... But we'll leave it at that because um, I, you, in your uh, response, uh, said that, uh, uh, you know, Islam has... The Quran has to be interpreted properly and you said this multiple times. Yeah. Uh, that interpretations and words change, meanings change. Whose responsibility is it to interpret the Quran? Ours. Because Quran.com and all the Qurans and the Tafsirs, which are interpretations, uh, are available to us. And none of them have a very different interpretation. The, you you look, look at all the Islamic scholars say on Quran.com and they pretty much say the same thing. You uh, Please answer this in context of this is not core to Islam. You, he, you were responding yeah, to A very good response, I am sure you will all agree is it is the responsibility of the Muslim community plus our state. State means the Indian state to do that. Why else are we funding the madrasas? We are not funding the madrasas to give benefit to Muslims. We want to create a sense of moderate Islam. That's the reason why Yogi Ji has given the epic amount to the madrasas, largest in the UP history. Why do you think India government is supporting the madrasas to promote a moderate version? Else the Wahhabi, the Wahhabi or the ultra-Islamist ideology will take root. Saudi Arabia, as he rightly said, Saudi Arabia was officially funding. Even the Sufi Mahabanjayat said, Saudi Arabia's petrodollars are ruining Islam. So yes, whose responsibility it is? It is, of course, the Muslim community. So being Indian Muslims should be their identity. And it is the responsibility of Indian state. Wonderful. Please don't, and just one line, please don't be under the illusion that it is out of Muslim appeasement that we, we means as a nation are funding these madrasas. We want to promote and generate a moderate sense. We should not be like China where they impose things, but we can have a very soft dialogue with the Muslim community and reinterpret why else is Modi ji's government doing that? Why else is Yogi ji's government doing that? We want to promote that moderate version of Islam versus the Wahhabis or the extreme. If Wahhabi words offend even Muslims who are saying Daesh or Wahhabi, whichever name you want. So we are at war with Islamism, not Islam. We are at war with Islamism, not only us, the world is at war with Islamism. If we have to win, we need to have moderate Muslims on our side. But there are 150 crore Muslims around. Are we going to make enemies of 150 crore or one sixth of population? Are we going to make enemies with them? So we need a moderate ground and we should fund in the sense we should support the rise of moderate Islam against the extremist Islamism.
So I want to come back to my outcomes question. Another point, I'll take your point that the Indian state must uh, pull its weight and reinterpret uh, the Quran. I'll take your point and maybe leave it to you to answer if you want to. Yeah. But uh, you talked about an eye for an eye cannot be the rule going forward and Muslims of today cannot be held responsible. And because you know how many temples will we take back? Uh, you are defending that we need Kashi Vishwanath, Ramja, uh, Mathura. Mathura, Krishna yeah. Janmabhumi and a few temples. So I have uh, firstly a quote from um, Professor K.K. Muhammad of uh, retired PSI and then um, I want to talk about the uh, Muslims actually fighting endlessly in spite of many interventions done by everything from Sri Sri Ravi Shankar to several uh, Madhadi Patis trying to coach, advise the Muslim side that please vacate the Ram Janmabhumi temple, now the Kashi Vishwanath, give away. But there is nothing but saying that we are victimized and we are under attack. There is no reconciliation coming from the other side. So I don't even know how this holds like a, if you don't mind me saying, a lecture to the Hindus. It should actually be for the Muslims and the outcomes, like I said, the consequences are showing that they are unwilling to give an inch of what is rightfully belongs to the Hindus. So I, I don't know who you are making that point to in defending that Islam is a religion of peace because they're actually sh the outcomes are totally to the opposite. Point number one, I want to come back to Professor K.K. Muhammad. In the case of Ramjan Mubhumi Mandir, he's gone on record in one of the interviews and said that absolutely you can't hold today's Muslims uh, culpable for all the crimes done by Mughals and the Turks and Afghans and everybody for a thousand years. However, if they do not hand over the Ram Janmabhumi and a few key important temples and actually continue to do uh, things like fight cases and if I may add my own words and go and offer namaz or whatever your flowers at Aurangzeb's grave, then you are culpable. He actually said that, that the current Muslims are culpable if they continue to behave this way. So, um, do you want to... Hey, I'll have quick response. Totally respect. We should encourage people like Sri K.K. Muhammad who is a Muslim by birth or Muslim by background, but he fought Hindu cases. He actually went for renovation of hundreds of temples and that's one thing we should admire and we should adore. The point is, Sri Sri Ravishankar ji, all our people had created a ground for conciliation. We should honestly appreciate, even Nidin Kadgiri ji went on record to say that one of the important credits for Ram Mandir should be given to Sri Sri Ravishankar because Muslim side trusted him. And at the end, even Supreme Court did a balancing act. See, a nation's soul is in balance. Supreme Court had various five judges and they give extra acres to Muslim community for building their Dhanipur mosque in the name of what Prophet Muhammad. What else can be done? See, a conciliation space was created. I think everyone but, will agree. You are actually proving the point there, of the there other were, side. There were no wide scale protests, there were no violence, there were no any kind of thing after the verdict came. Our intelligence agencies did a great thing. Nobody is saying no. Muslim community by and large with small murmurs accepted the verdict. It's something positive. I think we should see that. It's something positive. We didn't have any kind of thing that happened after the destruction of Babri Masjid. Don't okay. you think these are positive signs? Yes, Even absolutely. our government should it, take it. It may no. absolutely be a positive sign. We'll, we'll park it here because I don't think you're answering my question head on, which is to say that actually they should come forward and reconcile and say sorry for the pathetic the mistakes, 20,000, 40,000 temples, whatever be the number. Here are the five temples, please take them over, we are sorry. See, that's an ideal situation, but I don't think that will happen, but I would only end, say, yes, exactly. say one thing. Exactly, exactly the point. As, as far as my interactions with the community, if I can just add one thing, even in the Babri Masjid case, see, if the whole number of 30,000 is not invoked, many Muslims are comfortable in talking about Kashi and Mathura. I'm not saying they are ready to give, but they are comfortable in at least bringing it to the table. But if you are going to say 30,000, which is against the advice of people like Sadhguru, even Subramanya Swami disagrees. Even Subramanya Swami says there should be an end to it. Subramanya Swami only says, you know, two temples should be included in the exception uh, to places of worship act. But if you are going to invoke 30,000, naturally you are going to scare Ramji, Muslims. Who is invoking that? That is the there ultra so fringe. But let's look at the RSS. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the fringe. The RSS official stand is just four or five temples. No, RSS stand has, they have even gone be, uh, okay, you know, beneath whatever. that and say that we are not going to not participate even, even in worse. Madhura and Kashi, even Kashi worse. and Madhura. Even worse. But all worse or good. <laughs> I know I am not good enough to comment on Pujaniya Sarsang Chalak Mohan Bhagavad Ji. But he says, he says we are not going to have any more temple agitation. There should be some reason. They are proud Hindus. 
because a sense of balance should be maintained for our harmony but I that's mean, the sacrifice they are, they are making the, uh, yes absolutely and they are not uh, allowed to represent the entire hindu community that's that true. that's absolutely clear however at the same time you know even for four or five temples there needs to be some muslim organization at least which is coming forward and saying okay here are five temples i'll rest my case here but uh, neeraj do you want to I yeah yeah i just joined. wanted to uh, one was about that munafiq thing सच्चे मोमिन तो बस वही हैं जो अल्लाह पर और उसके रसूल के पर ईमान लाए और अपनी जानों से अल्लाह के रास्ते में जिहाद करते हैं द ओनली कंडीशन फॉर ट्रू मुस्लिम इज दोज हु पार्टिसिपेट इन जिहाद देन हो सकता है कि तुम्हें बुरा लगे तुम पर जिहाद फर्ज किया गया फर्ज फर्ज है इसमें कोई ऑप्शन नहीं है कि आप नहीं करोगे तो हर वो मुस्लिम जो जिहाद करता है वो अच्छा मुस्लिम है तो जो के के मोहम्मद की या हम बात कर रहे थे हमारे कलाम साहब की वो बैड मुस्लिम्स हैं दे आर अकॉर्डिंग टू कुरान अकॉर्डिंग टू इस्लाम दे आर बैड मुस्लिम्स और हमारा पॉइंट यही है हर बार डिबेट ऐसे डिरेल हो जाती है हम आइसोलेटेड मुस्लिम्स का एग्जांपल दे देते हैं अब्दुल हमीद का कलाम साहब का के के मोहम्मद का और फिर हम बोलते हैं हम डिबेट जीत गए डिबेट इस्लाम पे है कि इस्लाम इनहेरेंटली वॉयेंट है वो पीस की बात ही नहीं करता तो एग्जैक्टली तो exactly. एक अशफाकुल्ला आता है बाकी कोई नाम नहीं आता लेकिन वही लोग बुरहान वानी की जब वो निकलती है तो वहां पे लाखों आ जाते हैं तो एक तो जिहाद फर्ज है ये डिफरेंस आप समझ लीजिए कि असली मुसलमान कौन है जिनकी बात कर रहे हैं वो असली मुसलमान ही है अकॉर्डिंग टू कुरान वो असली मुसलमान हो ही नहीं सकता और जिन्होंने जिहाद किया यही लोग अल्लाह की रहमत के उम्मीदवार हैं दैट मीन बाकी के नहीं है तो के के मोहम्मद होंगे या अब्दुल हमीद होंगे वो अल्लाह की रहमत के अगर कोई अल्लाह है तो उसकी रहमत के वो उम्मीदवार नहीं है अब ये ड्रामा जो खेला जाता है एग्जैक्टली exactly वही ये हमारी न्यूज़ आइटम्स में भी ये होता है कि 58 जब अजमल का साहब आया था कि 58 मरे उसमें बाईस मुस्लिम बाईस मुस्लिम थे एक्चुअली में वो जब मारने आया है तो वो काफिरों को मारने आया है ये कोलेट्रल डैमेज होता है या वो मुनाफिकों को मारता है अब ये मुनाफिक वाली बात को यहीं पर छोड़ रहा हूँ और एक दो छोटे छोटे पॉइंट जो राहुल जी ने उठाए थे वन इज के आर वी गोइंग टू एक रिफेंज ऑन मुस्लिम्स नाउ अगेन दिस इज रिटोरिक हम मुस्लिम्स की बात ही नहीं कर रहे हैं ना रिवेंज की बात कर रहे हैं हम इस्लाम की बात कर रहे हैं इट इज़ एग्जैक्टली लाइक पोस्ट सेकेंड वर्ल्ड वॉर जर्मनी हम अगली पीढ़ी को नाजी नहीं बनाना चाहते लेकिन हम ये चाहते हैं कि इसको उन्होंने दे स्पेसिफिकली मेड अ रूल के कोई भी निगेशन नहीं करेगा कि होलोकॉस्ट नहीं हुआ था हमारे यहाँ पर निगेशन होता है कि कुछ हुआ ही नहीं जी ऑल वॉज हंकी डोरी हम तो इतने हज़ार साल से मुसलमानों के साथ रहे हैं Actually, this is what is called negationism. This is bad history. This is bad nationalism. जो जर्मनी ने किया था उन्होंने स्पेसिफिकली स्टेच्यूट में लॉ डाला कि होलो कोस्ट को जो डेनाई करेगा उसे पनिश किया जाएगा दैट इज वॉट वी रिक्वायर ओवर हेयर क्योंकि मैंने आपको कॉन्टीन्यूस लाइन में दिखाया कि हिस्ट्री में क्या हुआ है देन राहुल जी सेट आर वी ट्राइंग टू मेक मुस्लिम आर एनिमीज नो वन इज ट्राइंग टू मेक मुस्लिम एज एनिमीज पंद्रह बीस करोड़ हैं क्या हम उनको समंदर में फेंकेंगे बिल्कुल नहीं फेंकेंगे उनकी उनके ऊपर कोई जिम्मेवारी नहीं है कि पास में जो हो गया वो हो गया वो हमारे लिए हमारे वो भाई हैं जिन्हें हम वेलकम करते हैं खुली बाहों से कि आओ हम आपको कन्वर्ट करने को तैयार हैं घर वापसी कराते हैं जो स्वामी विवेकानंद ने भी कहा था कि हमें इनको रिकन्वर्ट करना है वी आर विलिंग टू डू दैट कोई दुश्मनी नहीं कर रहा हम केवल इस्लाम की बात कर रहे हैं कि हम और ये याद रखिए कि इस्लाम का पहला विक्टिम मुसलमान बनता है मुसलमान महिलाएँ बनती हैं और वो प्रताड़ित होती हैं तो अगर हम इन सबको इस्लाम से बाहर निकालते हैं तो हम उनका भी भला करते हैं अपना भला करते हैं इस देश का भला करते हैं और अगर एक्सटेंड करें तो पूरे संसार का भला करते हैं और फिर आपने कहा नहीं ये एक और था आपने बोला आर वी ट्राइंग टू के अगर हम ऐसा मांगेंगे तो राइट्स विल बी अनलिस दैट इज द टर्म दैट यू सेट ये आज का न्यूज है ये पहली जो बात मैंने बताई थी एन आई ए स्मोक्स आउट आई एस आई एस मोड्यूल इसके मैं तीन चार सेंटेंस एक बार बोल देता हूं हैड सेल्फ डिक्लेयर्ड द विलेज ऑफ पड़घा इन रूरल थाने एज लिबरेटेड जोन एंड एज अल शाम कॉन्स्पिरेसी टू स्प्रेड टेरर एंड कैरी आउट एक्ट्स ऑफ वायलेंस अक्रॉस इंडिया टू परपेट्रेट वायलेंट जिहाद खिलाफत आईएसआईएस एस एटसेट्रा एक अन ओथ ऑफ एलिजियंस टू द खलीफा ऑफ आई दिस इज वॉट दे आर डूइंग और यही आज के न्यूज पेपर के फ्रंट पेज पे जब आप नीचे देखते हैं पिक्चर्स ऑफ लॉर्ड राम लला सेंटम रिलीज पांच सौ साल बाद हमें ये मिल रहा है ठीक है किससे मिल रहा है हमें वो रिलीजन ऑफ पीस से पांच सौ साल लड़ने के बाद मिल रहा है तो जिस रिलीजन से हम लड़ रहे हैं क्या वो रिलीजन ऑफ पीस है 
हजारों टेम्पल्स हैं और अभी भी हम यहाँ बैठ के कह रहे हैं कि दो चार हमें दे देंगे तो हम सेटिस्फाई हो जाएंगे वो दो चार से सेटिस्फाई नहीं होने वाले उनका डिक्लेयर्ड ऑब्जेक्टिव है पूरे संसार को कन्वर्ट करना वी आर वी आर ट्राइंग टू लिव इन अ फूल्स पैराडाइज और हम लोगों को उल्लू बनाने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं क्या और जब हम गांधी जी पे आते हैं लेटस कम टू गांधी जी उन्होंने एक बार बड़ी अच्छी रीडिंग दी थी मेरे पास उनका कोटेशन है एक जब मोपला में हिंदू नरसंहार हुआ हिंदुओं को मारा गया वहाँ पे हजारों हिंदू मारे गए तो उसमें गांधी जी ने क्या बोला था दीज मालाबारीज आर नॉट फाइटिंग फॉर द लव ऑफ इट एग्जैक्टली यही वर्ड टिमरलेम बोल रहा था हम वहाँ पर सिर्फ लड़ने नहीं जा रहे हम जिहाद करने जा रहे हैं गांधी जी आगे क्या बोल रहे हैं दे आर फाइटिंग फॉर वट दे कंसिडर इज देयर रिलीजन एंड इन द मैनर दे कंसिडर रिलीजियस एग्जैक्टली हिट द नील ऑन द हेड वो तो उनको अपीज करने के लिए बोल रहा था लेकिन बिल्कुल ठीक कह रहा था कि वो जो उन्होंने वहाँ पर रेप किए हैं महिलाओं के साथ प्रेगनेंट लेडीज के वूम काट के बच्चों को बाहर फेंक दिया है जिंदा लोगों की चमड़ी उतार ली है उन्होंने मारा है उनको काटा है वो उसको अपना रिलीजन समझते हैं और उसके अकॉर्डिंग काम करते हैं तब से लेके आज तक हमास वाले यजीदियों के साथ वही करते हैं ये सारे संसार में यही हो रहा है हम तब अपनी आंखें खोलेंगे दैट इज द ओनली पॉइंट या जस्ट वन क्वेश्चन ओनली वन ही सेड यू वाज टॉकिंग अबाउट स्वामी विवेकानंद डिड स्वामी विवेकानंद इवन कन्वर्ट वन मुस्लिम टू हिंदू डिड ही दैट इज नॉट द पॉइंट ऑफ डिस्कशन राहुल जी दैट द पॉइंट दैट इज नॉट द पॉइंट ऑफ डिस्कशन व्हाट इज द पॉइंट द पॉइंट इज स्वामी विवेकानंद वाज एग्री टू एक्सेप्ट अ प्लूरलिस्टिक फ्रेमवर्क It is not as if we can convert twenty so, crore Muslims back to Hindu dharma. So you, you, so my point is, is like, yeah, yeah, and I have, is, I have read that, but I have also shared the pluralistic perspective of his quote. I have also shared why Vivekananda is, didn't even convert one person. I mean, that's the greatness of him. I am not saying he's bad. That's the greatness. Saying that you be a good Muslim, you be a good Christian, you be a good Hindu. This was the attitude that shared by people. Vivekananda even did didn't do karvapasi of any. Rather, if you go to Belur Math, one of the best Christmas Eve celebrations in India is in Belur Math, where the Hindu sannyasis do aarthi to Jesus Christ and Mother Mary but on again, December twenty-four. Pluralism. That, the point is pluralism point, no, and Vivekananda was taken, not. But that point is taken. Vivekananda, Vivekananda was not bringing back people. Rah Rahul ji, but that is. Are we going to become them, or are we trying to make them to a pluralistic framework? Are we going to make them? Are we going to them and say that only Krishna is God and you should discard Christ, you should discard Allah, you should discard oh, Quran? Okay, okay. Or are we going to make them pluralist? Yes, Rahul ji, okay. Rahul ji, should we, we try to raise them to the level of pluralism? Rahul ji, so Rahul should ji. we should we try to raise them to the level of okay. pluralism? Please One answer that. That is the point. Correct. Okay. Okay. Instead of trying to convert them, that's the point you make. No, okay. not convert them, but rather make them accept a pluralistic okay, framework. Okay, but this is a, de a debate which is away from the topic. No, the, uh, rather I, I, I would say this is what this is one of the core talking. aspects but, because okay. you are saying no, no, Quran about. is trying to convert us all. So let us convert back Muslims. You are going to have negation, negativity with negativity, which will only give us more negativity. That, that may not be the point here, but yeah, okay, yeah. go ahead. When we talk about pluralism. it is just like say let us say we are trying to set up a new colony or a new city or a new township and what we find out is that okay we require such number of schools such number of teachers such number of students such number of plumbers such number of carpenters okay all of these are here now let us be a little more pluralistic let us get a few dacoits let us get a few rapists let us get a few pedophiles let us get a few murderers that is what we are trying to say over here राइट बिकॉज अ ट्रू मुस्लिम हु इज अ ट्रू मुस्लिम यहाँ आपको दिखाई दे जाता है जो जिहाद करता है वही सच्चा मुसलमान है इसका एक सेकेंड एनालॉजी भी है कि हमारे शरीर में कोई कष्ट आता है हम डॉक्टर के पास जाते हैं वो कहता है देखो आपके ना पैंक्रियाज में और थ्रोट में कैंसर के सेल्स हैं कैंसर वंडरफुल प्लूरलिस्टिक मेरी बॉडी तो बड़ी प्लूरलिस्टिक हो गई है कि कैंसर सेल्स हम इनको ख़त्म नहीं करेंगे हम यहाँ पर कीमोथेरेपी नहीं देंगे हम इनका इलाज नहीं करेंगे हम इनको थ्राइव करने देंगे हम इनको माइनॉरिटीज क्योंकि माइनॉरिटी में है तो जो हेल्दी सेल्स हैं वो मेजॉरिटी में है इसलिए इनको भी बड़ा होने दो क्योंकि वी वांट अ प्लोरलिस्टिक इथोस No, this is the same opinion. Are we going to see? They saw Sanadana Dharma as dengue, cancer, malaria, and he said we shouldn't fight, but we should eradicate. Absolutely horrible. You know, I shouldn't be even telling that, but I am only equating. Similarly, are we going to consider Muslims or Islam as some kind of a cancer? Then we ourselves are in trouble because 20 percentage, nearly 15 to 20 percentage of our people are Muslims. Rather, 
elevate everyone to a pluralistic framework where we should have an anti-force conversion law. We should support... Why, why, Rahulji, why do we need an anti-conversion law? Anti-force conversion law, because, because otherwise... Because there is, there are some forces which are trying yes, to forcibly convert. Yes, obviously, even Mahatma Gandhi's son was converted. Rahulji, just a minute. I agree. Just a minute. Yeah. So, there are forces which are trying to forcibly convert yes. people, right? Yes, There are only two religions of yes. that nature. That is the point. But, but remember, that the, is the point. Th that there is, the is point. where we differ. That is the point. Christianity is not the same as conversionism. Islam is not same as Islamism. For example, you might have Islam? seen the movie Kerala story. I personally know them. They are a, a, a particular girl was Nimisha. Her name was Nimisha Fatima. Her brother is a major in the Indian army. He was forcefully converted and taken to Syria or Afghanistan. We don't know where right now. But are we going to hold all Muslims like that? No. So we should extrapolate the extremist. Yes, they should be tackled. They should be taken care of. I am not the blind secular who says these problems are not there. Rahul but ji, are we Rahul going ji. to hold an entire religion because yes, some absolutely. people are doing some wrong things? Rahul ji, that is the point. That yeah. Un dono ki jo books hai, wahi convert karne ki baat kar rahi hai na. To aap ek Muslim ko keh rahe ki you don't believe Quran or Christian ko keh rahe don't believe Bible. What kind of religion are you trying? My to simple say? question. Take the ex of Indonesia, the largest Muslim nation, UAE. Do you know anybody who got forcefully converted going there? Yes. I mean, if there are there are minority of numbers. How many? Ah, How this many go ahead? This people is... in Bali, ashrams in Bali are constantly under pressure. They actually... We should resist that. No, nobody is saying no. <laughs> but that is we should resist that. So, that's no, Islamism coming in. So that's exactly the point. We are. Are we going to equate our Hindu activists to those people who rape Bilkis Banu and Asifa? Are we? I know there were absolutely horrible I don't statements. think anybody will agree with that. Rahul but are we going to equate every Hindu to certainly that? Not. Some people, certainly, certainly not. Certainly, we shouldn't. But same but way, see, hardliners no, don't no, represent their religion. Rahul ji, that is not the point here. We are not saying odd cases of we have to separate, learn to separate. Very beautifully said by Professor Kapil Kapoor that, and I paraphrase, we need to separate criminality from scriptural uh, sanction. Are you getting the point? Got it, yeah. Criminality versus scriptural sanction. These are two different things. Criminals exist in every religion, every race, jati, every Correct. country, everything. And they behave badly, they rape women, they do all sorts of bad things. Even bombing, even suicide bombing. But there is scriptural... Last week there was a yeah. Christian who bombed a Christian meeting in Kerala, which many of you might have seen. No, he was a Christian from the Yehovah Witness. He said they lack nationalism. They don't sing national anthem. And he bombed and killed six people of Yehovah Witnesses. His name was Dominic Martin. Right now he is in jail. Six Yehovah Witnesses were killed. And his argument Correct, was they are not nationalistic enough. Correct. But how does that state that uh, it, he, they don't have religious sanction from Christianity for bombing, See, for example? That's the that's bombing Christians says, itself. La, last year, one of the last century, one of the greatest. Islamic scholars was Maulana Abul Kalam Asad, who was an Indian patriot. He was our first education minister. He lived in this nation. He fought for this nation. Are we going to discount all those people? No. Now, if you are only call them exceptions, you are you. If you are only going to call them exceptions, you are demeaning millions of people who are ready to fight and die for this land. You are demeaning millions of Muslim scholars who believes. I mean, there are many scholars who might have said. Tell that two Kashmiri Hindus. No. Yes, that was that, that, that. Absolutely that agree. Four Kashmiri or five Hindu. lakh Kashmiri Pandit suffered. Nobody is saying no. So do we but want you to are saying that no. strand of Islam? You are a very pluralist no, no, strand of Rahul Islam. Ji, you are saying no. The point yeah. about nationalism has nothing to do with scriptural sanction of what, how to live, who to kill and all of that business. There may be nationalistic Muslims, but nobody is saying that there are no nationalistic Muslims. Please let's separate Muslims Correct. from Islam. We are debating Islam here. Yeah. In, the, in that debate, Muslims get colored by it because those who follow that uh, very fiercely are getting colored by it. No doubt about that. Are there genuine Muslims who followed Islam not being patriotic? Are they not being supportive of the Indian cause? So how we interpret Islam is a code. This is a See, rhetoric I, 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 I'll only Rahulji, I'll, I'll Rahulji, just answer Rahulji, one Rahulji, line. Please, please. See, Rah if we take Islam as a core and demonize it saying that all Islam is bad. And that's a, that's a way of telling. See, Muslim, that's the whole crux of innocence of Muslims, the uh, famous documentary, Innocence of Muslims was banned by India. See, that's a very wrong thing. Who are we to judge them? Let us see by we their are, results. Rahul if there are hardliners, we can debate and we can defeat them. Rahulji, we are the victims. That is why we need to judge them. We have 7 lakh Kashmiri Hindus out of Kashmir, right? True. There yes. are thousands of women, uh, Yazidi women who are still missing. Our 8 to 10 million 
ancestors have been killed kashmir is devoid of hindus all these are hard facts and we cannot just brush them under the carpet that okay we are we cannot touch the core of islam whereas this is all in the core of islam itself quran talks of jihad quran talks of kital fi sabilillah quran talks talks of subjugating kafirs quran talks of beheading kafirs quran talks about sex slavery of kafirs this is all what quran is talking that is the core of islam how can we say that it is not in the core and we must ignore it i humbly diverge from the proposition that it is the core every religion you can diverge but that is what you have to give some facts that is the point of difference absolutely we, point we have to pause give now. some facts we have to yeah. pause we have yeah. to stop this debate i will end yeah. with oh, my right. views which may uh, your Sorry. all the questions i have said basically are uh, quite oh, similar they've been answered Yes. This is perhaps a question that comment, you may ask. Uh, this is just a comment from somebody. Irony is that the religion of peace is never peaceful towards its own people who ever talk or try to reform Quran. Latest example is Saudi Crown Prince. Yeah, he's under attack as well. Sorry, I'll, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll actually continue. This is actually in the same spirit that in today's world there must be many there should be many Muslim intellectuals who should also come out and talk about negative and violent. Uh, contents of the Quran, but as we know, firstly there are far and few in between. Only one odd voice you hear from some sometimes in Indonesia, for example. I heard of a Mawlvi. At least this has been my experience. Rarely, the counter side is humongous and is you know all pervading all the all the time. <laughs> Absolutely right. And so, uh, just as Hindus, for example, we openly speak against um, sati or even flog ourselves constantly. in the same spirit perhaps there should be uh, you know an equal number of people who want to reform anyway so i, I think i'll wrap up unless you have a yeah, closing, comment. closing comment okay maybe closing comments and then i'll wrap up with... I, i was in i i was one in, invited for a sakir naik's program where you know his whole idea is taking one or two quotes and demeaning our hindu faith and saying that quran is science quran is scientific i mean we all know that you know he is bluffing taking something from here and they are saying kalki is prophet muhammad <laughs> i said if kalki is prophet muhammad it should have been written explicitly but the whole point is taking some cues here and there my only submission is we should not have counter hindu sakir naiks because you no know, even their community is fed up with the hard lines of sakir naiks and many muslim communities are against him too in malaysia predominantly muslim country they you know gave a censure against sakir naik for speaking against hindus and other minority the point is i agree with neeraj ji's huge majority of sentiments regarding our property our fertility rate our population we should be guard against we should not have a fake secularism we should stand up for ourselves we should fight for ourselves the only thing is we have two hands with one hand we should uphold the hindu interest and with the other hand we should be able to create harmony build bridges because otherwise there is no way ahead and i would conclude by saying that this is the balance that we should fight one hand we are a proud hindu one hand we are a proud indian or a human where we can synergize all this and huge majority of muslims will definitely agree to this the opposition to sakir naik is not a hindu sakir naik the opposition to taliban is not a hindu taliban the opposition to pakistan is not a hindu pakistan because if you are trying to become a hindu pakistan that is the greatest negation of bharat that's the greatest negation of hindustan and india can ever happen we should rise above we should help people rise above every religion to have a pluralistic framework because there are 6 to 8 major religions in the world every time religions will coexist we cannot make 150 muslims 150 crore muslims to 150 crore hindus neither we can make 200 crore christians as hindus but we can definitely provide a pluralistic framework where every religion is respected that is an exclusive hindu idea see the whole idea of respecting all faith is not a core christian idea is not a core muslim idea is not a core any other religion idea it is an exclusively hindu idea that every religion should be respected that's the reason why swami vivekananda is regarded one of the makers of the modern century by people like i forgot his name uh, people uh, many people consider viveka uh, md basham uh, basham where he says vivekananda is a maker of modern century because in 1993 every religion there was trying to imply that we are the best religion and all others are bad and vivekananda came there and said we not only tolerate we respect and celebrate every faith that's how hindus elevate to the world let us be vivekanandas show the world a pluralistic framework curb islamist radicalism curb christian conversionism but not christians not attack muslims or christians but attack attack in the sense ideologically oppose islamism conversionism uh, extreme naxalism 
but hold a pluralistic framework so that we can be Vishwagurus and show the world a better harmonious place to live. Loga Samasta Sugino Bhavantu. Thank you. Thank you, Ravaji. So your your actually closing comments in, in my view are not so much for whether Islam is a religion of peace or no, but actually a way forward for us as a country of what we need to do. More, you know, what the Hindu Samaj needs to do and how do we create a country which can coexist with Muslims. Uh, Rahulji, as you rightly pointed out, I was expecting him to say something about Islam being a religion of peace, which he did not say, because that was the topic on which we were discussing. And in some cases, he also conceded our point that Islam is not a religion of peace, although he's trying to conflate it with Islamism. Now, what we need to remember over here is that we are in the middle of a civilizational war. And when I say we, I'm talking of the entire world. I'm talking about Hindus as well as Muslims, as well as Christians. I'm talking about all of us. Because at human level, all of us are same, but we will have to choose which ideology is evil and which ideology is good enough to take us forward in 21st century and to our future generations. If we are trying to give our future generations an ideology which otherizes everybody else, like Quran does. Quran distinguishes humanity into two warring factions which are perpetually at war with each other, uh, namely Mohammed and Kafir. And same goes with Christianity, which talks about two warring factions, which is believer and infidel. This is sure shot recipe for a disaster for the for the world, because this is this will lead to unmitigated misery and unmitigated war throughout the world, which we should not give to our future generations. And that can only be done if. Uh, in the words of Swami Vivekananda, we can take the problems head on. That is what we need to do. And taking head on means uh, understanding the core of Islam. Understanding that for 1400 centuries, we've been battling it. And in these 14 centuries, we've lost geographically, we've lost demographically. The only time when we started a little bit of recovery was when RSMR started acting in the beginning of 20th century. But that was, uh, the breaks were applied when Swami Shraddhanan was killed. He was killed by someone belonging to the religion of peace. So what we need to do is reinvent our society, bring its vigor back. Don't, uh, let us not fall for uh, hollow sounding, but sorry high sounding but hollow words like pluralism which the opponent does not respect, multiculturalism which the opponent does not respect because they have their declared objective that they are going to convert the entire world into their kind of thinking. They are authoritarian, they are supremacist, they are hegemonical in nature and they are so weak that the only way they win an argument is either by deceit or by a weapon. And if we, want, if we don't want our future generations to take this legacy from us, then we have to remember, understand, propagate that it is from Islam, from Quran, from Muhammad that all the terrorists draw their inspiration. And unless and until we disconnect them from this inspiration, we are not going to see a bright future for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Neeraji. I will drop all facade of my neutrality, which if any of that remains. I am a fierce proponent that uh, Hindu dharma, it's not only our responsibility to try and teach the other person um, ideas of, uh, great ideas of pluralism and hope to change them. But uh, I take a cue from um, Sitaram Goel, who actually says that one of the two, and I mention only the first one, the one of the two ways of solving the problem way forward is to actually appeal to the humanism of Muslims. In which case Hindu dharma, Hinduism actually has to become missionary. This is a, uh, I don't know what to call it, some sort of a sword or whatever we've put on our own necks uh, of saying that if we are born only Hindu, uh, that is not how most of Southeast Asia had become Hindu. Uh, or we had spread to the borders of Iran and all throughout. 
uh, even uh, beyond the Himalayas in, in Chinese territories and currently Central Asia. So my conclusion always is obviously that not only ideas of pluralism have to be taught, but at least we have to open up to people who want to return not by force, not by becoming them, by trying to forcefully convert them, absolutely, Rahulji, agree with you, but at least by opening up, at least by saying, please, if you want to return, here are 1000 ways for you to do so. That is all. I think we conclude this. Hopefully, it has been a useful session for all of you learning and hopefully for the audience online. We want to carry on these debates, uh, hopefully not with the Hindu side next time, but yeah. hopefully a uh, Malvi sitting on one of yeah. my either sides, perhaps with Neeraji and hopefully other uh, scholars from our side of Islam, perhaps also ex-Muslims at some point in time. Let's see how that goes. Thank you very much. Namaskar.